it's Erin and today I'm going to review Tristram Shandy which I don't have to hold because it's over there. Here's a picture. So when I finished Tristram Shandy one of the first things that I thought was oh no now I have to do a review of it. I mean I didn't have to but I was planning to and the reason that I was apprehensive about doing a review is because I felt like it was either gonna have to be incredibly short and really superficial, I really liked this book, yay! Or it was gonna end up being like an in-depth scholarly article or something because my feelings for Tristram Shandy operate on those two levels, generalized enthusiasm and wow, this is really academically interesting. So I hope that I have found a medium between those two things, but this review might be a little bit more chaotic than normal. Before I get uh, started, I wanted to say a big welcome to those of you who are here after seeing the video that Katie over at Books and Things posted. Uh, if you are unaware, uh, Katie at Books and Things is also a mostly classics focused booktuber and specifically Victorian fiction. She knows a ton about Victorian fiction. I am in awe of the depth of her knowledge and, and reading experience with that period in particular and she's quite a lovely person. I will link her recommendation video down below. She recommends a bunch of um, small classics focused booktubers. Also while you're there watching that video give her channel a check out if you haven't already. My subscriber count went up a lot really fast and it was kind of shocking and I'm so happy you're here. So Tristram Shandy. Tristram Shandy, or more properly The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy by Thomas Stern is just a tricky book to review generally despite my own personal angst about talking about it because it doesn't have a plot. It was published in nine volumes over uh, eight years, no over nine years between 1758 and 1767 and the episode episodicness of the novel is not necessarily contingent upon the strung out publication schedule. Dickens published a lot of his books not over nine years but over a period of time. That was a pretty common way to do things. Tristram Shandy is its own unique beast. And also, you know, those books had plots. I found the lack of plot in Tristram Shandy definitely to be the most bewildering thing for me. Part of that is not part of that. All of that is my own fault though because I went into the book pretty blind. In fact, I picked up Tristram Shandy. I knew that it existed, but I picked it up because I last semester was doing a project on the diary of a young man who lived in the early 19, 1900s in New Jersey and he read Tristram Shandy early in his diary um, keeping and was still referring to it years later and so it was one of the books that really clearly made a deep impact on him because that wasn't common for him to do and so I was really curious as to why he liked this book so much why it made such a deep impression on him and that's kind of what led me to want to read it and I am kind of grateful to this young man it feels a little bit weird getting a book recommendation kind of obliquely from somebody who's been dead for more than 200 years, but there it is. Book recommendations come in all shapes and sizes, time periods. So what I eventually discovered, as my young diarist I think discovered 200 years ago, was that the novel's very absurdity is what makes it so delightful. It invites us to laugh at the world, to see the world as a kind of comic place to be amused by the foibles and failings of humanity without really putting them down. It just presents them to us and says, look how strange people are. It also recognizes that life is far too complex and random to really portray accurately in a novel. And I think that's Stern's main point. He is telling us about how complex life is and like real life doesn't have a plot either. And trying to tell real life and give a reader the full sense of the circumstances that shaped a single person are so complicated that even after 500 pages we still only have covered a very tiny amount of Tristram Shandy's life which is to say almost none of it so that I think like I said is Trist and not Tristram is Stern's main point and that's why the novel is so 
random and kind of plotless. I think it's really interesting that Stern was noticing this kind of thing because 1758 is very early in the career of the English novel and the novel tradition in Europe in general had been around for maybe a hundred years depending on from when you're counting and only a few decades in England. So this is a very astute and interesting observation and a very interesting counter to the kind of like hyper realism of writers like Samuel Richardson. By the way, before I continue, some of these ideas I have gotten or developed from the introduction to the Penguin Classics edition of Tristram Shandy, which I highly recommend both for the introduction and for the notes in the back, which are very helpful. As I will um, mention again in a few minutes, Stern's book is just bristling with quotations and oblique literary references, and some of them are kind of obvious. He refers to Hamlet a bunch of times. Um, a lot of them just aren't because he's referring to really random stuff or like quoting his own sermons because why not? So that is a really good addition. Tristram Shandy is often called the first postmodern novel which is interesting and I can see why it is called that. Although I slightly disagree, just coincidentally I happened to be reading Thomas Pynchon's Gravity's Rainbow at the same time that I was reading Tristram Shandy. I am still reading Gravity's Rainbow because oh man. <laughs> That's a beast. I can see the parallels. So the parallels were very clear to me. The kind of randomness, the focus on the absurdity of life, the, the lack of a coherent plot. But I think that Stern's novel is much more hopeful and positive about life and the world than Pynchon's novel is, or postmodern novels in general, at least the ones that I have read. Stern is definitely amused by the way that the world is, but he is and, and is critical of it, but that doesn't lead him to any kind of hopelessness or despair, and um, I appreciated that. I came away from the novel much more uplifted and, and cheered by the fact of humanity, which was kind of nice to just be like, yeah, people are strange, and it's great. Once I realized that there was no plot coming, I was able to enjoy the novel a whole lot more because it really is about the journey, it's not about a story. So if you're the kind of person that can't stand that, then this is probably not the novel for you. If you are willing to just kind of settle in and enjoy the journey that Stern is taking you on, it's definitely enjoyable. One of the bonuses of having it written over a period of time in nine books is that it's pretty easy to read like one book comprehensively, they flow, but then it stops and you can put it down. Um, if you're afraid you're never going to come back to it, don't put it down in between books because it's really easy to not. But the, you know, the first audience read this book over nine years, so you could also do that if you felt like it. Um, in addition to the lack of plot, the novel isn't really about Tristram, despite the title being The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy. Tristram is kind of a character in the novel because he's the narrator, and Tristram is definitely not Laurence Stern from what I have read. So we get his opinions and a little bit about his life from his narrative voice, but he is almost never seen in the like narrative of the novel. Instead, the novel focuses on his father, Walter Shandy, and his father's brother, Toby Shandy, and Toby's manservant, Trim. There are a number of other characters, mostly men. This is a very male novel, a very male world. The only there's only two women that we really get a full picture of, um, Mrs. Shandy, Tristram's mother, and the widow Wadman, and both of them are kind of stereotypes. Not that Walter and Toby and Trim aren't kind of stereotypes in their own right, but there it is, a sign of the times, I think. Despite the novel being full of men, they are delightful men in particular because they are delightfully quirky and absurd. Walter Shandy has really strange opinions about noses, and names, which is why his son is named Tristram. Uh, he has feelings about things that don't matter. Toby has feelings about things that don't really matter either. He has what Stern calls a hobby horse or hobby. Toby was in the military and apparently found that career very fulfilling until he was injured in the groin, which becomes a kind of like key plot point. During his recovery, he starts reading about military battles and when he's fully recovered he basically builds like a mock battle stage in his garden and then uses it to like study battles and stuff and that's like his obsession and he he takes it to the point that 
his servant is like melting down the gutters and stuff so they have metal to make cannons like it gets ridiculous like I said at the same time Toby is not like some buff military man in another scene he releases a fly and is like goodbye little fly there's enough room in the world for both of us he's actually kind of a very gentle and even sort of innocent man his servant trim is loyal and long-suffering and also maybe wiser than his master and these people along with the doctor Obadiah and the parson whose name is Yorick form the kind of main company of characters and I really just I enjoyed reading about them because they are so strange and unusual. I keep like emphasizing that about this book but it's true that uh, Stern does such a good job of highlighting the absurdities and complexities of people and you kind of like you don't know someone like Walter Shandy who has strange opinions about noses because really that's weird but you do know people who have strange opinions about random stuff and you're like this does not matter the size of your nose not important to your life unless like it causes breathing problems or something that is not what Walter thinks but you you know people like that and you know people like Toby who get so obsessed with their hobbies that they like spend time putting videos on the internet about the books that they read or something these characters are complex and nuanced and you really like they're always surprising you you can't ever like quite pin them down but they're not really totally realistic. Tristram Shandy is a comic satiric novel even though it tends to be lumped in with early English novels along with Defoe and Samuel Richardson it really belongs more it reminded me the most of Alice in Wonderland actually or Cervantes Don Quixote or Rabelais uh, Gargantua and Pantagruel. It's in that kind of comic satiric vein. Its closest cousin in English literature would probably be, yeah, at that time, would be something like Jonathan Swift's Gulliver's Travels, not the realistic novel. It kind of straddles the border, I think, between novel and satire. It's not exactly a satire. If it is, it's sort of a, a mild one. That's something that I'm going to need to do more research in it. Um, speaking of research, there, I, I have been inspired, as I suggested at the beginning of this video. Despite the seeming nonsense of the book, even a little contemplation of it will show that it is very uh, competently and deliberately written and Stern knew full well what he was doing. Tristram sounds like he is just dashing off whatever comes into his head without a real plan, and maybe he is as a character and a narrator, but Stern, as the actual writer, um, seems to have a, had a better sense of what he was trying to do. The book is bristling with literary allusions, allusions to and quotations from Stern's sermons, like I mentioned. Uh, Lawrence Stern was a priest in England and just spent like 30 years preaching and then he wrote some stuff um, kind of right at the very end of his life that made him wildly popular for a while. And, and running through all of this is this really sharp awareness that we are reading a novel. This is a story. It's constructed. It's not real. A lot of the book's absurdity, I think, comes from Stern showing us that this is a novel. That we are, you know, he kind of like, we have expectations, especially modern readers who have been reading novels for a lot longer than his contemporary readers were. We have expectations for what a novel looks like and he kind of just throws all of those out the window and in doing so he makes us think about what a novel actually is and we recognize how constructed a novel really is. Once there's no plot you're like the novel needs a plot but then you think about well actually the novel <laughs> a, a plot isn't very realistic even in a novel like Dickens or like Richardson who are trying to be realistic it just Life doesn't work like that. Tom Jones is a book that Tristram Shandy is pretty deliberately spoofing and in Tom Jones there's an omniscient narrator who gives us the actual life of Tom Jones and it's very thick. Stern is kind of looking at that and being like you can't actually do this accurately if you want to. It's going to be fake. Tied to this parallel acknowledgement of the novel as constructed and as limited in its realistic portrayal of things is an awareness of the novel as an object. It is a physical thing and Stern also takes advantage of that in really interesting ways and this is something that I would actually like to study because I am interested in how writers and um, people think of a book as an object and use it like that. Stern is constantly reminding us that we are reading a book. His book is filled with 
quotations and paraphrases and copies of parts of books so that we kind of see it as participating in this conversation. And some of these are real and some of them are made up. The made up ones are very entertaining and fun. You should definitely um, look forward to those parts. Stern will often also use creative textual methods to make a point. For instance, when he tells us about the death of a character early in the book, there's actually two black pages in the book and they were in there in the original text. He just had like, he told the printer just like print a whole black page as a like a memorial for the death of this person. So he's thinking about the like some ways we can symbolically represent things through printing. Later Tristram rips out a page or a chapter that he's written. He tells us like I wrote this chapter and I thought it was bad so I tore it out and threw it in the fire and then there's like a blank page to kind of represent that missing chapter. The font changes in some chapter headings to make a point. I just I found all this really really fascinating. There's a point where Tristram is talking about the the general like narrative structure and like focus of his chapters and so if a really focused chapter is a straight line he like draws these like squiggly random lines to indicate like the lack of focus that his chapters have. That's really creative and interesting and it makes you think about the book as an object as something being written that and Tristan says it looks like this and he has a colon and then there's the drawing and so you, now you're thinking of him sitting in his room writing this book. So those are some of the things that I just find really interesting about the book. I know that I wasn't able to tell you a whole lot about like the story or even the characters and that's just because of the, the book is just hard to describe and characterize by itself. But I thought it was really wonderful and I really enjoyed it so I highly recommend it and if you do read it I would come back and tell me what you thought. That is it for this video. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Bye!